Good afternoon. My name is Oscar Garcia. I work at the International Fund for Agriculture and Development. And I was asked to facilitate this session of the EPE that will deal on communicating uh, the results of evaluations. Just uh, a few words uh, before we, we start. Uh, we have, um, as you know, the unit norms and standards that uh, establish that evaluation should be communicated, communicated freely and without any pressure or influence from management so that the results can really serve the accountability and learning purpose. So I think it's important that we hook our discussions in our mandate and our norms and standards. Um, at the same time, uh, different evaluation policies really derive from that uh, unit norms and standards and have specific mandates. And in the particular case of IFAD, uh, the evaluation is an important component of the knowledge management architecture of the organization. Namely, that we are sitting on a repository of evaluative knowledge and evidence that can fit and benefit the organization more broadly beyond the specific conduct of evaluations. So that is why we are sitting here in a panel organized uh, with, uh, together with other agencies. And I will, would like to take the opportunity to thank our colleagues from the Global Environment Facility, GEF, and from UNRWA, uh, for joining us in this effort to share some experiences. Uh, after all, we are in the evaluation practice exchange and to exchange also some practice in terms of how to use and disseminate more broadly uh, results of uh, evaluations. So, um, what are the objectives of this session? And to try to respond to two questions. The first one is how communications and outreach can be integrated into the evaluation cycle. Namely, thinking of communications not only uh, at the end of the process, in terms of disseminating the findings, conclusions, and recommendations of evaluated work, but how can we embed it into the overall cycle of conducting evaluations? And perhaps the assumption behind that question is that by engaging uh, communications throughout the cycle, we could facilitate really knowledge management and learning. The second question is how tailored communication tools should be for specific audiences, and how this uh, targeting uh, communication tools and, and, and instruments can help organization learning and ultimately can help organizational change for improving. So with these two questions in mind, I would like to uh, invite this panel uh, to, to start sharing their experiences. And the idea would be that after the brief sharing of experiences, either through presentations or through videos or through direct uh, uh, communications and talk uh, with you, we will have kind of a Q&A session. But since... Um, we are talking about communications. We will have a twist in our Q&A, and we will organize it as a press conference, all right? A press conference, as you know, when you are a journalist and you have uh, uh, knowledgeable people on the other side, uh, you don't do long comments. You just do a question, right? Because immediately after, uh, we will uh, change a bit the pace of our question and answers with this uh, press conference uh, approach to our Q&A, all right? But before that, let me uh, very briefly uh, ask uh, our uh, colleagues to introduce themselves, uh, and then we will uh, start with one presentation by uh, IFAD. Hello, uh, my name is Ksenia Timnenko. I, uh, here I represent Global Environment Facility <coughs> Independent Evaluation Office. I'm Robert Struck. I'm the Chief of Evaluation in UNRWA. And I'm Johanna Penetz, and I'm Lead Evaluation Specialist at IFAD. Thank you very much. Now we'll leave you with uh, Johanna, who will make the, the first presentation. Right, so we're talking about IFAD's communication approach. Uh, first, be, um, let me go back to the title, um, because what I'm not going to talk about is knowledge management. I'm only going to talk about communicating 
um, evaluations. I will share IFAD's experience on how we try to strengthen the communication, do it more systematically and more effectively, um, what, how we integrated it into the evaluation cycle and how we changed managing communications and um, yeah, developed also new products. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, okay. Um, uh, there was uh, some, some years back, there was um, a very systematic approach for IFAD, uh, IFAD's independent evaluation um, um, office to strengthen its communication approach, to develop a communication approach. And for this, it is very important <coughs> um, to differentiate between dif uh, two different sets of questions. So first, we have been looking at um, the, what we call the first order questions about the communication ob objective. To whom do we actually communicate? Why do we want to communicate? And what do we want to communicate? So these questions are very basic to keep in mind before then actually developing a communication approach which tells us how we communicate, what needs to be done to communicate better, and to, to, the, to those um, whom we want to target, by whom and when. Because Sometimes when um, evaluation units, uh, the communication units develop their communication approaches, they start looking at the second and at the second um, part of it. They start with the product, say, what could we do? We can, how can we use social media? And don't really think about what the objective is, whom they want to target, and how they could do it best. So um, that's why we di differentiated those two sets of questions. Um, in IFAD's um, evaluation cycle, um, we have integrated communication uh, through the various uh, phases uh, because that's also a very important lesson that you don't start thinking about communication at the very end in terms of dissemination. So once we have a product, you know, we start thinking about how we could communicate it, we disseminate it. But we start integrating communication, right? Is that now working? Which one? Okay. Um, right from the beginning, so um, integrated b even before we start designing an evaluation. The first thing we do is we establish a core learning partnership. That means basically we identify the stakeholders in, the, in this evaluation, we try to um, map them out and integrate them um, uh, into our, our approach, evaluation approach already. So we know whom we're going to, to work with throughout this evaluation, for what purpose, and who will need to learn from this evaluation. And that we call a core learning partnership. Um, we develop an um, approach paper, as most of you do, we in, we, and we include an evaluation framework in that approach paper. I will em I emphasize that evaluation framework, also because I'm the evaluation specialist, but also uh, because it is very important in terms of communication. What an evaluation framework does, it makes your approach very transparent, and that is important for you to communicate uh, to your stakeholders as well. So it's an important communication tool if, if you wish so, although it's being developed from the technical side. Yeah? Uh, we have a preparatory mission and inception workshop. We have the main mission for the evaluation, as all of you do. Um, but then we also have the in-house and in-country workshops, uh, even before we finalize the evaluation report, which is an, another important um, tool. And then um, for um, um, country program evaluations, but also now for, um, um, for um, project evaluations, we have an agreement at completion point and a management report, uh, response. The agreement at completion point um, means is that we, with, uh, we agree with our partner institutions on what you know, we have found and what we're going to do about it. Um, and um, then in the very end, we, we actually launch the evaluation documents. Okay, um, what we have in, in, um, in the independent office of evaluation is a communication unit, and I think that's quite a unique thing. So that used to be the case that uh, communications is done by IFAD's communication unit, communication about evaluation, but now we have a dedicated communication unit within the independent office of evaluation who takes care of communicating communicating evaluations and communication about evaluation. They have a number of, of roles, which I just quickly um, outlined. They do, of course, the publishing. Um, they do the graphic designs. Um, they, they are in charge for maintaining the website. 
and they um, also uh, serve as communication focal point. They develop new tools, which I'm going to show you in a moment. They upgrade uh, and manage the, our own website, Independence Office of Evaluations website and databases. And of course, they're in charge of organizing the information um, processes and the uh, learning events. Um, we have some pictures on evaluation event on, and uh, learning events which we did earlier. It's, I don't know why it's not very clear. Things a bit blurred on that side. Um, so it's for instance um, on the on the top side. You see, they uh, we had a. Uh, Indigenous Peoples Congress uh, last month in, in Rome, in IFAD, and there we shared an, an uh, evaluation synthesis about Indigenous people and how the uh, IFAD has worked with Indigenous uh, peoples. Uh, we have a, this is the country, uh, end of con uh, country program evaluation, country round table workshop in Tanzania, um, and we had the same in China when, in our country program evaluations. Um, so now I'm coming to the main products which um, IOE is doing. Um, we're having um, as an important product, which I also put outside um, for you to take away, uh, we have the annual report on results in IFAD. Um, this is a very important um, report which we, uh, which we use uh, where we review the performance of the organization. And it's very similar to what we had yesterday you know, in, in our our um, uh, discussions that we look at performance ratings across projects, but we also benchmark our performance against other agencies working on similar topics, for instance, on agriculture. And then we have for each RE, as it's an annual report, we have a learning theme. So one theme where we dig deeper and try to extract some lessons for the management, uh, for the project management. Um, and um, this is a, uh, this, 2014, it was about project management. It's a very, what we call, flagship report. We have the corporate level evaluations, which are red. Uh, so it's our evaluations done at the corporate level. Um, so for instance, the largest evaluation we had on was on fragile states. This one was on ground financing. Uh, we have country program evaluation, like this one on China, which is yellow. Um, sometimes we also produce um, um, or very often um, evaluation overviews where we have a, uh, the executive summary and the management response. And these are quite handy to be given away from, you know, if you're in country um, and for higher level people and who don't want to read the whole report. Um, we have done, uh, we're doing project evaluations, of course, which are uh, these project performance assessments in blue. And we're doing impact evaluations, um, so where we look at impacts in, in particular, um, and there we also include, um, for instance, surveys where we have a control group and we look and yeah, it's it's a more um, extensive data collection exercise than in your normal project evaluation. Um, and we're also doing these thematic reviews. Um, uh, and thematic reviews, I just explained it in the earlier session, is uh, a review of, um, of um, evaluations uh, under a common theme. So like this one was on middle income countries, yeah, in green. Also having all sorts of other, um, other um, products, like a short, for, a short flyer on the IFAD, uh, on the IOE, um, we have a kind of leaflet on where we describe our, our approach to country program evaluations, how we do it, which we, which we put out on our learning events. Right, then a very important um, um, product and new products, um, uh, fairly new products are the um, uh, profiles, evaluation profiles and evaluation profile basically um, for, covers the main essence of an evaluation. So it's a, it's a leaflet, a very handy leaflet, where we look at the kind of main three or four findings, conclusions, and recommendations and present them in a very digestible and accessible way. Um, we do that, of course, and we go to countries like China, we do it in Chinese as well. Um, and then we have the insights. Um, this is a different product. It's different from the profiles because it would focus on one issue where it tries to extract some learning experience on one issue. Like for instance, this one was on promoting innovations and scaling up 
impact in China. So it's one issue which we have extracted because we think it is very important and relevant. So we do leave it like this. Um, we're having some innovative um, products um, um, right, right now. Uh, we're starting to do uh, videos. Um, I have the links included, but I don't think we have time to look at them. Um, for instance, two, two different um, um, videos. One was on the annual performance um, review, where we, where we present the key findings and key as the essence of, of the um, annual performance review of the organization. But then, like for instance, a, a video which we have done in context with the Bolivia country program evaluations, where we had beneficiaries commenting on what they think the achievements were. And this is also a very powerful communication tool, yes, um, for um, uh, especially also um, feeding back into our board. Um, and then, um, as innovative um, products, we have infographics. You saw them outside, um, talking about evaluation findings. Um, yes, so these are the very various um, <coughs> products. So, website, um, a knowledge sharing tools. We have a website, a special, um, it's not very clear actually. This, um, on the IFAD website, you find the IOE website under evaluation, and there, for instance, you have all the evaluation publications. That's nothing, nothing special. All, all evaluation units have it, uh, but I think this is done in a very nice way because according to types of evaluation, and what is uh, quite innovative <coughs> is um, having also an interactive map where you can find the products for each country, each and every country. Um, so that's... Um, evaluation. Um, okay, lessons learned. Uh, lessons learned from um, having strengthened communication in IFAD, um, in IFAD's evaluation, is that evaluations have become more visible and also more appealing. So the products are nice, people tend to, tend to read them and look at them, and they use the website and access um, the reports. Um, we, we are able, with, with this, all these diverse products which I uh, showed you, we are able to, to communicate better with a broader and more diverse audience um, and um, uh, yes, so tailored on their communication needs and interests. Um, we have strengthened the in-country uh, feedback loop right through, through this country um, round table and the agreement at completion point. Um, and within the organization, which is also quite important, we have uh, also a more active feedback loop where we, for instance, also track recommendations from evaluation in a very systematic way. Uh, but in order to do so, also people have to know what the evaluations have been saying, so it has to do uh, a lot to do with communications. Um, okay, so that's basically um, what I wanted to share with you, how if I'd if that's independent office of evaluation um, does communication. Of course, you will find this uh, presentation on our website with working video links, which are not working in what you have on your <coughs> stick. If you want to watch the videos, you can go online and find it there. We have already said 2015. Unique evaluation week, you'll find that. Okay, thank you very much. Hello once again. I will present uh, here a global uh, environment facility, independent evaluation office. Uh, here we also uh, we have a group of people working on uh, communications and knowledge management. Uh, my supervisor Juan Portillo, uh, senior operations officer, uh, he oversees uh, technical uh, issues related to communications and knowledge management. Um, Anna Birgitta Vick, our senior uh, senior evaluations officer, uh, oversees. Um, substantive issues of communications and knowledge management, and I am a knowledge management officer in the, uh, in the office. Uh, those of you who attended uh, sessions yesterday with on performance evaluations and impact evaluations, are there any, is there anyone who attended those sessions yesterday? Yes, we have. <laughs> yes, so those of you who attended these sessions probably heard already about the organization. Let's see again. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so we have a beautiful graph that I just decided not, not to repeat that shows the structure of the GF. GF is a partnership. It means that uh, we have a, an added level of complexity and difficulty 
related to communications. Um, so it's a partnership of uh, 14, uh, 14 organizations, 168 wow. countries, if I'm not mistaken, different layers of responsibilities, uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, perspective. So the mission of the Independent Evaluation Office is uh, written here or in the on slide is it enhance global <coughs> environmental benefits through excellence, independence, independence and partnership in monitoring and evaluation. So why global environmental benefits again? Because that's the main, uh, the main purpose of global environment facility is to, um, to contribute to strengthen the global environmental benefits. Um, <coughs> oh, okay, it's a little too fast. Thanks to for Oscar, uh, for, Oscar uh, for, uh, match, uh, for starting with uh, UN norms and standards because actually they do uh, they do the tell uh, th these norms and standards tell us that uh, um, communications and follow up to uh, evaluations is uh, is a part of our mandate. The interesting uh, interesting is that um, the monitoring and evaluation policy of GF also is very specific. It, uh, it includes expectations that findings are disseminated dynamically and are accessible to target audiences in a user-friendly way. So in, in, in this presentation, we chose to talk, uh, to talk about three examples of specific, specific examples related to challenges, what we did and what we learned through, throughout the process. And at the end, I will talk a little bit about the general takeaways. Okay, our first one is uh, the FIPS overall performance study. <coughs> the overall performance studies are very important for our organization. They are conducted every four years uh, and they inform replenishment of, the, of, of our institution. So basically they make conclusions uh, uh, about the overall performance, uh, about the progress towards impact, and they make recommendations about the next, for the next four year period. The FIPS overall performance study, uh, you, you see the cover page of uh, the final report, was, co was conducted in 2012 and 2013. It was, a again, a very uh, intensive activity. The whole office, almost, I think it was the whole office worked on it. Um, and the result was also very impressive. Uh, we, had, we had the final report that which included 46 recommendations. Also, there were, there were 21 technical documents, each of them representing special study uh, contributing to the main report. In addition, there, were, there was a first report and progress report. So altogether, about a thousand pages of very important, high level uh, messages that are important for the organization's next four years. This represents a challenge at least from the communication perspective. What would you do if you wanted, if you had this very important, very big product, uh, and you would want your organization, different parts of organization to remember these messages and the messages to stick? What would you do? <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> examples of our infographics so if you want to see them please find them on your page on your on your tables <coughs> so first why did we choose infographics what do you think <laughs> hmm? easy to understand Exactly. According to science of communication, most people are visually dominant, except for people who were born blind. So <laughs> graphics helps, graphics helps uh, digest information. It helps uh, to understand information quickly, more quickly, and th therefore it helps to retain conclusions and, and recommendations. In other words, graphics helps data stick. Uh, so we created infographics to help our partners understand the main findings 
uh, in a relatively short time frame. We also wanted to use a more engaging format than, uh, than uh, a printed document. So what are some of the lessons learned of the process? First of all, it's a team effort. It, is, it takes, um, the creation of infographics requires a buy-in from the evaluation team, who would need to allocate a certain amount of their time and energy. Um, it is also, there are different approaches to infographics. There are free ways to create infographics. But uh, since we represent large international organizations, it may be best to involve professional designers. And when we involve professional designers, it is best to choose those that, are, that have some subject matter knowledge of, what's we, of uh, what is being evaluated. Evalu uh, creation of infographics takes time. It took several rounds of iterac uh, itera uh, iteration with a graphic designer. It, it is also important to include uh, several rounds of uh, feedback with the evaluation team, with partners, and with everyone, anyone who you can have, uh, your friends and your family. Because we need to make sure that we communicate the messages that, are, that come from the data, that come from the findings, uh, and that we communicate them in a way that is understandable. <clears throat> also, we learned that not everything can be translated in a visual image. And if it doesn't, it's OK. So we just don't translate it. <laughs> so how was this uh, infographic used? It was disseminated during GEF assembly. So again, the assembly uh, takes every every f uh, takes place every four year every four years. So that's again a very important high level event. Also, OBS five was made the infographic was made a landing page for uh, for the uh, final report. So if someone whoever wants to access this page uh, and who wants to access the final report or any technical documents or any other documents related to the study, first they see the infographics. So here on this graph you see uh, some web access statistics. Uh, and OBS5 is a red line, so, we, uh, so it's the access to the landing pages of the OPS5 report during the first, uh, approximately the first year after uh, the final report was issued, compared to OPS4 report. The report was created four years ago. So we can see that there is some difference. There are some, some spikes uh, during the after the assembly and after the council. But in general, of course, infographics was only one of the communication tools and one of the communication activities. So there is no way we, there is no way we can attribute directly um, and so we need to think more how effectiveness of such products could be measured. Our next example. <coughs> so here on this, uh, on this uh, chart, uh, on this slide, you can see uh, uh, our theory of change. The Evaluation Office has developed the generic theory of change as an exploratory tool to uh, see the causal links of how the GF support leads or doesn't lead to uh, progress towards impact and uh, uh, to global <coughs> environmental benefits. It is an exploratory analytical tool, but at the same time, it is used uh, in uh, our impact analysis, it is used in our evalu evaluation report, or, or, I'm sorry, evaluation reports, including the fifth overall performance study. And it is also necessary for evaluation consultants who work on, the, uh, on, the, um, on, on such analysis to understand it. At the same time, some of the language used uh, in the uh, theory of change is not universally known, accepted by the evaluation community. So it's, it's very innovative, and it's, it's changing. All, uh, so uh, we don't, OK, let me stop here. Um, so this, rep again, represents a challenge. So we have an innovative language, innovative concepts that are important for our partners to understand, because this is how we communicate some of the findings of the impact work. Again, what would you do to communicate those important and uh, innovative concepts? <laughs> No. 
So we chose storytelling. So basically, we created an animation. So why storytelling? According, according to the science of psychology, <laughs> especially according, to, for example, to research conducted by Princeton University, uh, stories help uh, engage the whole brain of listener. And they have done, uh, in Princeton University, they, even ha they have done the, uh, the brain uh, scans of uh, the audience and of uh, speakers. And it appears that during stories, our brain activity um, synergizes, if it is the right term. So if you really want to connect with our audience, stories are very good and very powerful way. So the example that we chose was the example of uh, energy efficient light bulbs. <laughs> Be why? Because um, uh, this example is uh, well known throughout the GF partnership. So, and it's, it's very easy to relate and to connect to. If we have enough time, we, uh, we will show uh, this short video at the end. Um, so what did we learn while creating this? Uh, Story. Oh yes, two minutes. Uh, okay, so it's a team effort again. We need a dedica dedicated evaluators who are really dedicated to make sure that uh, their findings are understood um, by general audiences. It is 95 conceptual work and only 5% technical. <laughs> so, but also while whilst you are creating conceptual uh, concepts, um, make sure that uh, graphical images are also understood. Right. I wanted to talk about the third example, but let me just show it here <laughs> and not, not say anything. We can talk about it later. <laughs> okay, so what are the general takeaways? The general takeaways is uh, the universal design principles that are used in education, in urban planning, in architecture, they also it seems like they work in evaluation communications, especially when we address global audiences, diverse audiences with different backgrounds, different professional uh, and cultural again, backgrounds. Uh, and the principles of universal um, design are simple language, short sentences, concrete examples that your uh, audience may relate to. I don't want to, so the examples that I gave were mostly about one-way communication, what kind of products we develop to make sure that the messages stick. But actually we know, we are, we are fully aware that communication is a two-way process. And the example that I didn't talk to uh, is is example of our um, pilot activity with several evaluations in the office where we are thinking from the very beginning how to engage stakeholders in the, uh, in a consultation and communication process. Uh, yes, and I think I wanted to have one more, yes, one more takeaway, is that evaluation communication is still a new activity. It's, it's a new field. So we need to continue learning from our experience and we need to continue when we need to learn from each other. So each of us does something and we experiment. So we need to learn what, what works and what doesn't. Thank you. From small to big, how we achieve greater impact. The Global Environment Facility provides funds to help countries protect the global environment. But compared to how big the world's environmental problems are, the funds the GEF provides are very small. Luckily, the GEF doesn't work alone. The funding that the GEF provides is just part of the story. It works hand in hand with partners such as governments, the private sector, civil society, communities, and other partners, all of which have the bigger role of expanding and building on the projects the GEF has funded. Then we start to see a larger impact on a global scale. Take climate change, for example. All over the world, carbon dioxide emissions are increasing. Life-threatening weather events like heat waves and flooding are affecting everyone. So what can we do about it? A solution? Light bulbs. Energy-efficient light bulbs, to be exact. Just replacing a single 60-watt incandescent bulb with a 9-watt LED reduces the required energy by 85%. That means lower carbon dioxide emissions. Now, one light bulb won't change the world, but what if we could change lots of light bulbs? What if every single person on the planet switched to LEDs? Challenging? 
Yes, but definitely not impossible. Here are several ways that GEF partners can make this happen. These can occur at the same time or in any order. One way to larger impact is for interventions originally supported by the GEF being continued by partners without GEF support so they keep the positive environmental benefits going. Let's say the GEF works with the local government to introduce energy-efficient light bulbs in a city to make sure everyone in the city knows how good these light bulbs are for the environment, an awareness-raising campaign is also started. The GEF project also helps formulate regulations to phase out the old kind of light bulbs so that light bulb companies will start selling the new kind. After a few years, the local government sees a large decrease in the city's energy use. So, even without GEF funding, they decide to fund a program to make sure the new light bulbs are used everywhere in the city, and they officially adopt the regulations that the GEF project helped to formulate. A second way, often called replication, is when a GEF intervention is copied elsewhere at a comparable scale. Say the local governments of three cities neighboring the original city in our example hear about what's happening and want to reduce their energy use too. They visit and learn how the first city did it. They also start to introduce the energy-efficient light bulbs, launch awareness-raising campaigns in their own cities, and implement regulations to ban the old kind the same way the first city did it. A third way is when a GEF-supported initiative is implemented at a larger scale, expanded to include more political, administrative, economic, or ecological components. The national government hears how energy consumption has decreased dramatically in a part of the country where not just one, but four cities have started to introduce energy-efficient light bulbs. It decides to do the same thing, but for the entire country. It also launches an awareness campaign, this time at the national level, and passes a law that reduces taxes for all private companies that sell energy-efficient light bulbs. To further reduce carbon emissions, the national government also puts more funds into building renewable energy power plants. A fourth way to achieve greater impact is for the information, lessons, or specific aspects of a GEF initiative to become part of partners' own initiatives. The success of the Energy Efficient Light Bulb Project in reducing energy use is now well known, and other partners decide to use some ideas and lessons from the project in their own environmental projects as well. Some civil society organizations design awareness-raising campaigns the same way the original GEF project did. Other donors decide to use the regulations the GEF project helped formulate in their projects in other countries around the world. A fifth way to make a larger impact is through market change, when economic demand and supply shift to more environment-friendly products and services. Because people are becoming aware of how good the energy-efficient light bulbs are for the environment, they keep buying more and more of these light bulbs from the stores. Private companies see that it is better for their business to invest in this kind of technology and start selling only the new kind of light bulbs. GEF projects contribute to change, but for larger impact to occur, GEF partners do a lot more. It's through all these ways, when interventions are continued by partners without GEF support, when they are copied at a comparable scale in other locations, when they are implemented at a larger scale, when lessons or specific aspects of a GEF initiative become part of partners' own initiatives, and when demand and supply shift to more environmentally friendly products, that GEF partners can move from light bulbs in a single city to light bulbs in countries all over the world. And when enough people use these energy-efficient light bulbs for long enough, the CO2 emissions will go down. Hopefully, all the devastating heat waves and floods will disappear too. Of course, energy-efficient light bulbs are just one example. The same kinds of action toward larger impact need to be taken for protected areas, water treatment plants, cleaner factories, and the many other initiatives that the GEF funds. Global environmental benefits may seem like a big goal, but with GEF funding and all partners working together, making the world a better place is not so hard to do. For more information on how the GEF is achieving impact, see the fifth overall performance study at www.thegef.org slash gef slash OPS5. 
No, um, thank you very much. And uh, we, we talked a bit before, and I said I will contrast um, what is presented. And I didn't know how stark the contrast will be, because actually we're nowhere near to be able to afford any of this. And we, will never, we never will. Uh, on the other hand, fortunately, um, in the region where we work, um, it's a quite um, interpersonal culture and storytelling both organizational as well as in, in the region is dominant, which eases our problems slightly. Um, but I would like to start with, let's say, one of the more, um, how does it relate to the norms and standards and we have to publish. So we eventually negotiated with our executive office and we got to the point where, yes, evaluations are public. Uh, for example, when the Syria one went public, the day later some of the donors started calling, which is a great feature for quality control, for outreach, and it's demand driven. So uh, we never print anything. We don't have the funds for that. They do it. I mean, they print it because they're happy to see it. Um, in the past, we had to get around that. Uh, so we had a steering committee with external members, which then made things public because once some donors have it, nobody can deny it to others. And that's the way we got around some of the objections. But we overcame that by now, so we're now fully compliant with it is public. Um, I want to address quite um, directly the questions. So how is it integrated in the cycle? And as I said already, um, we have a quite interactive culture, plus we have very few stakeholders. So the people who are really interested in these things is maybe 50 from the various, so it's maybe 20, 30 in the agency, and there's another 20 outside. But then there are no more people who are actually interested in the things. Um, so it's manageable to actually engage them and have a dialogue with them. And we have a dialogue when we do the evaluation work plan, which, which covers six years by now and is attached to the, the agency strategy, which also covers six years, and we talk to everybody, basically, on various rounds. Then we draft something, we go back to them, we talk to them again. So we create this report and buy-in from that stage already. And we basically do the same in the actual evaluation. So there's the, we call it background paper, it's, uh, and the background paper includes the creation of a theory of change and so on. And it's an extremely interactive process, which takes between two months and six months. And it's lots of meetings and verifications. Did we get this graphic right? Complain now, you know, shut up forever. And uh, again, this enables us so that people can actually own the theory of change and the product. And it's a, it's a two-way communication. We have to have that two-way communication. Likewise, at the end, there's preliminary findings, and we get everybody together in a workshop setting. Not nearly as fancy as we've seen on the picture here. It's some sort of grayish room normally. But um, the, the concept is exactly the same. I mean, people are there, they listen to it, they have to react in person, and other people can challenge it, and because it's a, it's a public setting, it limits people's um, ability to, to just drive it into a, one strategic direction because the other stakeholders are there and they co they, they're able to correct it. And that's, that's part of this getting the message out there plus getting consensus and, and drive, coming to a common conclusion. And then after it, because you asked throughout the programming cycle, at the end, we do the same with our recommendations. We don't just send out papers. Um, I, because it's a small place, I can sit with the client, I have that discussion with them, and say, how do we understand that? How do you understand that? And so on. And then um, the formal process just confirms the, the previous discussion. Which then brings me to the second point. The second question was, um, how do we tailor that? Well, I would argue in our case, because it's a very specific culture and the resources are limited, we tailored it to that culture and have that personal interaction to, to get the message out there. And I leave it at that. Thanks for the opportunity.
Yes, here it is. Um, to, to our colleague from IFAD, if you were starting an evaluation communication um, initiative from scratch, in retrospect, where would you begin? I mean, if, you were, if you were trying to develop evaluation communications for your evaluation office, starting from scratch, where, where, would, you be, where would you begin? What would be your advice on where to begin? One by one? Or, um, well, where, where we would begin is, is well, having a proper understanding of who your audiences are, isn't it? I mean, that's the, the first thing. Is that what you're asking? Yeah? But you're responding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thanks. Okay, who else? Please, here. Yes, <coughs> Gentle. Uh, as said, uh, I'll try to speak loudly. Thanks a lot for the, the presentation. It's very, very useful. I have uh, uh, two questions uh, that I want to ask to the panel. Um, I, I, I was wondering, with all the materials that you have presented, if uh, you have a kind of assessment or uh, follow-ups that you do with the various audiences to see how your communication materials are perceived in order to, uh, to improve um, them uh, over time. The second element um, that I want to ask you is um, how much the community, meaning um, those from which, uh, for example, the data is collected receive also information or communication uh, from uh, uh, the, the materials that uh, you, have, uh, you have presented. Uh, allow me to add another question, if possible. We have lots of hands up. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's a very short one. It's, uh, has it always worked? Any side effect that negative side effect that you have to deal with? Thanks a lot. Thank you. So I will ask uh, Senia to, un to answer the first one on measurement, and Robert to answer the second one, and uh, then perhaps Joanna would venture on the third one. Thank you. So I, I have shown the graph. So we, we started doing something, some follow-up, uh, the effectiveness measurement. But certainly, there is a long way to go. We are planning a, a, client, survey, <coughs> a client survey or f a feedback survey on our knowledge management products. So we'll probably, in a, in a few months, we'll be able to, to say more about perception of our products. You're putting me on the spot. We had, at some point, we were successful in feeding information back to beneficiaries. And we have very strong desire from people who were part of interactions in communities to hear back what happened from them. At some point, we were able to do that. Uh, currently, we're renegotiating our ability to reach out. But it is extremely high on our priority list to get that back because uh, once you get people involved, they contribute to the evaluation, they want to know what happened to it. It's, it's absolutely essential and we need to sort it out and I'm very aware of it. Thank you. Additionally, in a few May, uh, with Inipa, we have tried the videos. And uh, showing the videos on evaluation back to beneficiaries has been proving a very way, interesting way to engage them. Um, and if I we have the luxury of having an evaluate, uh, communication unit, as I said, and that's a very good thing as such uh, because it enables us to, to develop what we have been developing. Um, if you ask about side effects, perhaps there is an issue about, you know, um, ownership on behalf of the evaluators. So that is a communication which is actually something all of us should be doing is very much seen as, as task of an evaluation, a communication unit, yeah? although we may not have the time to do it. But all of us should engage in communication. Thank you. Okay, who, who wants to continue over there and there? Uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you very much. I just want to ask a simple question. My name is Reginald Chima from UNFPA. How do you manage the temptation of using infographics not to impress? but to communicate, educate, and inform non-technical audience. You know, I have seen a lot of infographics, including the one you presented to us. Sometimes they look like a book of infographics. 
And it becomes difficult to distill clearly what the main message is. And so you will have to manage those two, trying to impress your donors, impress your audience, and then send a message. Just tell me how you manage that thin line. Thank you very much. Allow me to take that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, as, as uh, Senia was saying, we're innovating, right? And we're getting into new domains and terrains. And infographics is one of them. Very recently, a debate about uh, what are the best infographics uh, was taking place online. And uh, the answers were varied, by, but there were two, two at least two streams. One saying, it's a, it's a story. It's a story that, 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 that is behind it, an infographic, that really makes that compelling in terms of what are your findings, what's the theory of change, what did you really found in terms of the linkages to leading, leading or not leading to performance. Right? And the other is the quality of the data, right? Because the data is really sometimes not sufficiently explored. And by using infographics, you're trying to go one step further, right, in terms of making that data more digestible, if that data is of quality. But Thank you. And I would like to add, so as I've mentioned, the infographics was only a part of a series of different products and activities. What was much more important was timing for the fifth overall performance study. The many meetings that were planned and conducted, the additional meetings that the senior management decided to have to make the messages stick. So it should not be seen as a uh, magic wand, I would say. So it's one, uh, it should be a tool of a many. Right, um, my name is Ashwani. I'm a reporter from E5 News. And <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for the delegate from Jeff. Could you please tell me what is the underlying quality assurance process for your infographics? And how do you ensure a harmonization of the messages in the infographics as, as compared to the evaluation report? Thank you so much. So as I have mentioned, that's an uh, iterative process. Uh, our office is relatively small. So uh, we, uh, there were several, quite a few rounds of iteration between, uh, with the evaluation officers and then up to the deputy director and the director of the office. The report was not, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, infographics was not released, was not published until we got the final okay. Uh, and of course, we always, we, we had to go back to the report. We, ha we, uh, we had to make sure that <laughs> no findings come out of nowhere. <laughs> no conclusions come no, of nowhere. Thank you. Over there. Um, I have a question. I mean, your, your presentations were very impressive, but taking into consideration that probably not all organizations, I, I include myself into that group, might have the resources to always make use of all these great tools of great products, which in your experience have you considered have been the most influential tools that you have seen, where you know you have presented a series of tools that you have applied in all your evaluations. So, which have you seen that have been the most influential ones? To whom was the question? To whom? My question is to to Jeff. Uh, in her experience, which one have been the most influential in terms? You know, if you want to reach management, or you know, if you want to influence change, which ones were those tools? I mean, were the storytellings, were the infographics? What were the most powerful ones? Well, as I said, we are planning the, uh, um, a survey, a, a client survey, where we would be able to say a little bit more. I th uh, and I think uh, the mo most important was, uh, I think, actually a combination of tools and strategic planning. <laughs> Knowing who your audience is and what are the key moments. So I think it's not the tool, actually. It depends. <laughs> I, I don't really have that much of a choice of tools, but um, to, to step back a bit, um, if the question is which would be the one I wanted most, <laughs> um, I think that would be the website. Uh, in, in a sense, um, the website would be the one that uh, immediately opens up to everybody and I would solve my beneficiary problem at the, because at least uh, in the region, people are extremely technologically savvy. They all do Twitter and this kind of thing. It, that's where the Arab Revolution came from. 
So the, the website would be probably the one. And what I've seen with the, with the little map and the, and the reports, that would be a, a very nice thing for us because it's such a manageable area. So we have these five fields and we could link the reports to it. Most reports actually they're strategic, so they're for the whole area, but still, this, this is the thing that I think would be most helpful. Thank you. Yes, I, I very much agree with our speaker from GF that it's the combination of tools actually, so how, you, how they complement each other. And for us, the most Im important thing was closing, uh, closing the feedback loop, yeah? so making sure that we really you know, reach out to our audiences in country and within IFAD um, in the project management and making sure that they understand what this evaluation is about and using different tools for that. Thank you. Over there. Uh, my name is Nandi Gesen. I'm from, uh, as Asmani said, uh, UNDP News. Um, I have a question about uh, your communications with the actual claim holders. All the development uh, benefits uh, claim holders. Uh, I would like to know how much of your communication budget is allocated to communicating with the claim holders. Thank you. To whom? Well, I am uh, quoting my supervisor <laughs> between three to five percent. <laughs> Would you like to respond? <laughs> okay, then uh, let me respond from, from the EFAD side. Uh, we have one P2 dedicated uh, to, to uh, communication and one consultant and an intern. Right? So the, the unit of three is one intern one consultant, short-term consultant, and a P2. A P2 that uh, had a half time and moved to full time in 2015. So that is mainly the, 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 the core. But what we have learned out of that is that uh, evaluators are very good at evaluating, but not necessarily at communicating. And so really, even at a P2 level, that, or half a time of a P2 level, that can support the communication side in more digestible way of presenting the results of an evaluation make a huge uh, difference. And the, the, the several products that you have seen here are really coming out of a, a very small but dedicated team of professionals. Okay, let's go now to the middle that has been neglected in terms of uh, their questions uh, in this press conference. Thank you, a, uh, a question for the colleague from IFAD. Um, oh. You talked about the importance of a simple and clear message. Um, Paul, Paul Valéry, a French poet and writer, once said, what is simple is always false, but everything that is not is unusable. unusable. Um, is he right? Or was he right? <laughs> sure, yes, well, no, uh, yes. Um, well, it's about, as Oscar said, it's about making it communicable, isn't it? It's not about simplifying things. It's they still, you know, have to be, uh, we, we do quality check and we make sure that it's correct, actually, what is being said, although it's, you know, simple infographics or whatever. And then again, it's not all about infographics and, and simple leaflets, yeah? So you need to see the whole, the whole package of uh, communication. So I think uh, accur accuracy and, and um, you know, being precise in what you communicate is very important. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think you hit the nail on the head and uh, w what I said earlier is you need to really know whom you're communicating to is extremely uh, relevant in this, this instance. So depending on who is there, uh, the, the level of accuracy and complication varies with the person you're communicating with. I mean, at least in our case, the, the, the higher the level, the more simplified the message has to be, recognizing that it might become slightly inaccurate because it's oversimplified. Thank you. Over there. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Aron Sasueta, the Global Environment Facility. Uh, thank you, very interesting. Uh, uh, there was, there was an, an, an area of communication somewhat uh, missing, and that is uh, social media and, uh, and blogging. Uh, are there, wh what are your experiences of social media and blogging? I know the GF experience, uh, and we have a lot to learn from others on that. Uh, could you share a little bit of that? 
Yeah, well, uh, no, actually, some, uh, that's something I forgot to mention. We are, no, we are, we are in, uh, working on it. We are uh, uh, going into it. Uh, I mean, uh, the Independent Office of Evaluation doesn't have its own Twitter account yet, so we're still, as you have seen, perhaps some of you have realized during this conference, um, you know, we're tweeting under the IFAD, you know, general IFAD um, um, address. Uh, but we, we do this, uh, and we have, uh, we're using microblogs and blogs as well, so it's, a, it's an area which we want to expand as well. Um, I mean, again, one needs to be careful on what, what the audience is, yeah? so whom you want to reach out through this. Um, so for us, still an important audience is in-house, our board, our country partners, so it's not, um, you know, they also need to be looked after. Let me complement that with two things. Um, Yes, we are starting to increasingly to use more social media to bring the attention to the reports. Because in 140 characters, you cannot really go more, much more deeper than that. And we are very careful in terms of not tweeting like a, 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 a judgment, you know, but data. Data that could be interesting from, uh, in, the, in the evaluation reports as a way of cross uh, uh, fertilizing different media for uh, out, reaching out with uh, the results of evaluations. I think uh, the question was addressed to IFAD. Uh, I can only say again uh, with the social media, we have a Twitter account. It is mostly at this moment used to uh, report about the processes. For example, if evaluations are going to the field, we report about that. If we are attending a conference, we report about that. Not much about uh, how the analysis is going. Uh, also. So, so far it, has, it was more push, push, uh, uh, push out. Right? What's the right term? So basically, one-way communication, just telling the world what's happening. With the, social, uh, with the blogging, so far, we, we started two years ago. At that moment, again, the whole office was very busy with our, uh, the, our uh, overall performance study. So it didn't actually stick much, uh, just because evaluators didn't have time and too much opportunity to, to contribute. So we'll need to probably revisit and see if it's, if it's going to be used. Also, <coughs> I recently learned about a survey, country opinion survey that World Bank does. And the, country, uh, the World Bank group actually does uh, the country, uh, like every country that the, uh, the World Bank uh, is present, they conduct country opinion surveys every three years. So, uh, and they ask about questions about effectiveness and about knowledge management and communication. And what they learned that at least the, uh, the uh, constituency of the World Bank prefers use letters. Again, it may be, uh, it may be changing. We are very, um, in a very dynamic field, but at this point, it's probably that use letters is probably the best way. <laughs> Thank you. Nani? <clears throat> and then we go over back there. Yes. Uh, Manny Jimenez from 3IE. I had a question for the chair, if it's fair. Uh, um, and that is, um, as the head of a, an evaluation group, uh, what will you hold the communication strategy accountable for? Is it the number of downloads, or ultimately, are, are you interested more in whether or not behavior of the evaluees are changing? Or is that even a fair question? It is. In a press conference, every question is fair, right, as you know. So, <clears throat> a, a very good question, because we had that reflection in the ECG uh, uh, meeting last year in December, and the World Bank was uh, impressing all of us with uh, 70,000 followers on Twitter, right? And uh, even a larger number on their Facebook. So is it really that our aim, to, to, to reach such a wide uh, audience? And I would say that uh, uh, to the extent to the, that it uh, enhances the use of evaluation, uh, could be. But uh, let's not uh, mix the, the, the means with the ends, right? And so uh, social media and communications are just means for doing our work better. It, uh, it also tells us that we are in a, in a world in which uh, we are also kept accountable right? as evaluation officers. And the quality of our work is checked every day in the reports that we release, in the way we communicate. And we need to live with that uh, uh, openness. 
and we get, get prepared for that. So uh, I think it's a trend that is there, and therefore we pay attention to communicate uh, the results of our evaluations, but really for enhancing the, the use of evaluations. Uh, I think we still have a, 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 um, some more mileage to, 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 to go in terms of the engagement of direct beneficiaries, because we know that uh, the, the, the audience that currently is participating in this type of debate are not uh, necessarily all of them beneficiaries, right? But uh, I think it's, it's a trend that is uh, difficult to deny. But thanks for your question. Over there, uh, we had a lady uh, uh, with a question for a long time. Janine Garcia from the GDF also. So my question is from the, uh, for the colleagues uh, from IFAD. How is the interface, how do you do the interface between your communications unit and the evaluators, or um, is, it the, is it part of the evaluator's task to do those things in the cycle, such as identifying the core partnership, or is there one person in the team who's in charge of that? Yes, um, well, this is, this is a very good question. Um, but first, the unit sits within the same team, so we are very, kind of, spatially, we are close together, um, and we're working very close together. Within the, the cycle, which I uh, um, described, it's actually most of the steps are the responsibility of the evaluator, so identifying your core part learning partnerships, doing the approach paper, and so on and so on. And um, the communication unit has very clearly defined um, responsibilities, like for instance, organizing the learning events, you know, editing and, f and finalizing, you know, the publication of, of uh, products, developing, you know, additional products. So this is what they're doing. So I think it's, it's, it's very clearly de defined on one side, but on the other hand, we are working closely together. We are one team, basically. Yeah. Right, thank you. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, I did, thank you. Uh, it seems that this presentation has mostly been about how we can squeeze evaluations, which are very complex, expensive, long processes, into the shortest amount of time and space and simplicity possible. And this is a result, I guess, of the world that we live in, in which you know images are at us all the time, and we're sort of in a race to the bottom to get the shortest, flashiest video. And I think a part of the conversation that is missing is about you know, you mentioned, I guess, Johanna, the, the, the stakeholders. It's not the audience on Twitter of 70,000 people. At least uh, in the case I can speak um, for UNICEF is that we really want our recommendations to be read and to be understood by UNICEF's senior management who are going to act on the recommendations that we make. And so I think the part of the conversation that has been missing has been how to get those people involved from the very beginning and how to make them want to read the full report, not how to um, sort of wash the world with a few tidbits of data on, on Twitter. So if um, I guess Robert could respond to that. That's more a comment than a question, but uh, yeah, I, mean, uh, I, I already spoke to that in the presentation, but I'm, I, I think I would like to expand a bit on it. Indeed, I think this is, it's very important what you're saying because it affects the credibility of what we're doing. And I do not think actually that it is possible to get really senior people to read the report. I mean. It's, it's a struggle. If I get the chief of staff for the agency to read the report, that would be the highest level that I can expect to have the whole report read. But um, I do believe that, indeed, it's not the race to the bottom. It needs certain time, especially because people at that level, they're strategic, they're not technical, so they need an interaction to understand what is in the report, what are the implications strategically for the agency. So I would personally say, no, it cannot be done in, in 10 second snippet. It, it needs probably an hour of interaction with Q&A and going back and forth, which still saves them about two hours of, uh, you know, it's, if it's three hours to read the report, the one hour back and forth probably give, gives them a reasonable understanding on what, what has happened, and they would feel reasonably comfortable to base their strategic decisions on that discussion. And if they really want to, they go back to the relevant sections of the report. 
Uh, <coughs> Uh, it's, it's actually very sad that um, if our panel concluded uh, that all, all, what, all that we have to do is to turn um, uh, evaluation findings into short messages, and I agree with Robert, this is, uh, it's just the, uh, the challenge of global organizations addressing ma many stakeholders. In the GF, we have a very special structure and very special process of working with decision makers. And I, and I was thinking maybe uh, uh, my colleagues would like to talk about our interaction with the council, if I may ask. <laughs> no? <laughs> yes. Um, I would want to ask, uh, to respond to your comment in two ways. Um, first is, is uh, with the kind of events and the kind of products we have we raising the appetite and interest in our evaluation. That's very important. Then we organize, for instance, um, learning events where we distribute the report. We make it available, a draft report, um, beforehand so people have an opportunity within the organization to read the report and come to the event, bring their comments, and, and then it will be discussed. So that's a way also, you know, organizing an event. So it's a certain point of time where people actually have to read and prepare for you know, uh, submitting their comments. So we're not letting go the full report, but as, as you said, not everyone is going to read the full report. So there are certain parts of the organization. The other thing is, is I mean, there is a little flavor about um, uh, social media and, and short messages being superficial, um, which is not necessarily the case. I think it's an extremely good exercise for you, as it is to write a, a country program evaluation, Colin, or so, do an evaluation in 100 days, or writing country program evaluation in 30 pages. Yeah? That's an extremely important experience to do it, or to write an abstract on two pages about an evaluation, and as an evaluator to learn to, com to, to um, communicate complexity and being precise about it in a very short page, uh, in a very, very short space, is, is a good skill to be learned. And like I, I've been blogging before, and I found that extremely helpful just to think about what are actually the key messages you would want to co communicate, isn't it? It's, it's like writing an executive summary which helps you, which you should do before, after, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Colin? Uh, I'm a journalist from the, the gutter, what we call in the UK the gutter press. Uh, I, I work for the Daily Mail. And, uh, frankly, I think aid is just a waste of money. And uh, I love your reports because it proves the point every time. Uh, I love to get hold of a, a good EFAD report. I like to sensationalize it a little bit and show that there's massive corruption in many countries in, in which uh, EFAD has a presence. And I, I also was looking up the figures the other day, and I know the director of evaluation is paid at least $300,000 a week. Um, so so I'd, I'd, I'd like to know uh, how the panel responds to this kind of gutter rubbish that I produce all the time. Tell me. Good. Thank you very much for, for that question. I think that also poses uh, some of the flip sides of developing these uh, communication tools which are related to, to the cost question, right? Because uh, is this uh, a, a good use of resources, let's say, to, to enhance into fancy reports or, or things like that? The questions could be raised, you know? And, and uh, uh, I would say that uh, the cost of engaging to communications for a broader audience are not really that high. But uh, regarding my salary, I think you have the, 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 the figure is a bit uh, distorted. No, no, the, the salary was a tease, but the question before wasn't. I mean, how do we avoid uh, giving the perception that uh, aid always fails, uh, that it's always a mess? You know, there are a couple of bright spots, maybe a couple of successes. But uh, if you have a predatory press that wants to show that development doesn't work, I mean, we know it does work, but uh, you know there are many people who believe it doesn't and that it's a waste of money. So how do we stop them sensationalizing perfectly good evaluation reports uh, and giving the wrong picture? Because people hear first from the, the Daily Mail, uh, they don't hear it from the EFAD press office. 
I mean, d d yeah, dear colleague from the Daily Mail, um, in, in our case, it's, it's not actually sitting in the evaluation office, but as an agency, um, because we're working in an extremely political environment, we developed a defense mechanism to that. And so there is very close monitoring of several media, and our communications person is willing to pick a fight with people should they go off. And, uh, and some of you might have seen the Fox News uh, versus Chris Garner's uh, debate. And that's exactly what needs to happen if that is the case. On the other hand, once uh, an evaluation report is, is out and to the public domain, it kind of has its own life. And uh, yeah, in terms of, uh, it will be used not only in the day of its release, it will be used 10 years later, right? Or five years later, it will be synthesized, it will be meta-analyzed and so on. And in that sense, I think we, we need to be responsible with what we produce and how, what we sign off uh, as uh, the evaluation report. And that's why I, I was kind of careful in terms of uh, the use of this social media, new ways of communicating, on just trying to get the attention to the reports instead of saying that the performance of the department X or B has been uh, uh, unsatisfactory, right? Because that, that really is not what we want. And what we want is to bring the attention to f read the full report or to provide some data about the perf what the, the, the organization is doing here and there. But um, yeah, I think that those are uh, the risks that we are uh, engaged to. All right, any further questions, last minutes that we have? Please, Deborah and then uh, Valeria over there. Or it could be the other way around, Valeria and then Deborah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. I have a question for the IFAD colleagues. I wanted to know if you developed sort of a formal written communication strategy uh, detailing all the components, the objective, the components, uh, of your strategy, and then if you have, uh, if if you have a formal strategy, if you have updated it or changed it as you go along. Well, we developed a, um, a, a communication approach, what I described in the beginning. It has been some years back, though, so it was before the evaluation unit, uh, the communication unit has been created. Um, but ba and it was not a very elaborate strategy. It was a simple paper um, outlining the broad steps and areas, and, and ever since. I don't think it has been um, they, they, any plans to redo that exercise for now. Yeah? So it's sometimes back. But it helped to shape. Um, to sharpen the, the um, attention um, um, to communication because I think there was a discussion at that time and because I was before my time, Ashwani will know more about it, um, that came up through the peer review of the IFAD uh, um, um, Independent Evaluation Office saying we need, to, we need to enhance the use of evaluation. We, we are quite good in producing a large number of evaluations. I think you know, we have produced more than 150 evaluation reports, which is a huge number. But then, you know, instead of shelving them or having them half finished, uh, getting them up to standards that they can be communicated, being put out, and being also understood and, and taken up. So that was basically um, what that strategy responded to. Thank you. Yeah, yes, thank you. The, um, uh, so Deborah, the UN uh, past former UN evaluation group chair, <laughs> as of a few hours ago. Um, but communicating uh, evaluative information, research information, and getting it used, um, I, I think we, we really, we're hearing some good strategy here, and we have to be so much more strategic. I, I don't think we ever will control how it's used. I worked for the US government for 20 years and was um, involved in getting information to the US Congress. I worked in AIDS at CDC for 30 years in public health outbreaks. And you never control all the misuse. And you know, if, if you're inf there's so many things that you learn. If your information is boring, they're going to sensationalize it and turn it into something people want to read. So that means we have to learn how to turn it into something people want to read um, and still stay true to the facts. Um, the uh, very frustrating experiences working in the AIDS and sex education arena with young people and showing how all the literature is showing the beneficial effect to provide comprehensive sex education to kids and comprehensive. Uh, 
uh, comprehensive AIDS education. As, as this research comes out and proves the value and the efficacy, uh, our administration comes out with political decisions of an abstinence-only curriculum and no funding for school-based education that doesn't include this value-based message in, fa in the face of all the research evidence, in face of the meta-evaluations and the international, and in the face of the National Institute of Health just convening consensus on it. So that's very frustrating to evaluators and researchers, and certainly for us at CDC those years. We went to congressmen and we went to their staffers who said, why? How, what do we do? Help us out here. They said, first of all, your messages are too complex. You talk and we don't understand. It's got to be simple. We've got to be able to understand it. So otherwise it won't get used. So others have said that uh, it needs to be simple. It needs to be compelling. It needs to be information that makes a difference to us. It can't be modest effects or numbers are still the same or 1% or 2%. It's got to be about half the people in our jurisdiction or, or three quarters of the young people or some kind of compelling, interesting thing people want to read. And then third, it has to be salient, meaning it has to be information when we need it. Um, so much of the time, and in my career, my uh, directors have said, you know why we hate evaluation, Deborah? And I said, no, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. It's never on the same timeline that we are as policymakers, decision makers, legislators, activists, etc. We say we need at the end of the day. You say, oh, but we are still in the middle of this. We won't be done till the end of the week or the end of the month. They say we want at the end of the month. You say, well, at the end of the year or at the end of the year, and we've got a two-year study underway. So what I learned how to do is a, a sort of like three parallel lines of information. If I'm asked today about what's going on in an evaluation I have that won't be done till the end of the year, I have some information that I can provide them. And in fact, they don't want the full results of the evaluation anyway. They want those snippets because they're either feeding it into politics, feeding it into press, feeding it into other arenas. So we have to always be prepared to give information about our uh, studies to the, the people asking for it and not just put them off until we're done some months or years later. Um, feed the beast, feed the information beast with information that you actually can be prepared is, is a lesson there. And then also, it's not just the uh, politician, the, the senior leaders you're after. In fact, their attention span is three minutes and there's 50 people addressing them in a day. It's the people around them, their managers or their handlers or with congressmen in the US, it's their staffers. Their staffers make a lot of decisions. And you know your leaders too. There's a lot of people um, in a chain of command man that are making the decision. That's where you spend some effort that we saw actually made a difference um, in helping them to digest what was coming out of our evaluations that actually then did take hold and started to change policy program. So I'm wondering if you had similar experiences um, in your, your groups. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, reflections. Very thoughtful, uh, Deborah. Thanks for sharing the, the experience, first hand experience as well, of dealing with communications. So I think it was a very, very rich and interactive uh, session. I want to, to, uh, to thank all of you. Let me just uh, try to, to uh, address some of the issues that we touch upon. First, that uh, it's part of the unit norms and standards. I mean, we as evaluators really have the right to. Uh, present freely the results of our evaluation publicly. And it's important not to remember that, and that is enshrined in the evaluation policies of many of the uh, unit members. Second, it's important to start measuring also the, the effects of all these uh, uh, communicative efforts to see and calibrate them better. We know that we are uh, entering also into uh, new terrains. That's why it's important to be innovative uh, and also innovative in the storytelling, as we have seen by the examples of the GEF. We want to keep the messages uh, simple with short sentences and concrete examples that would be useful uh, later on. We also learned that it's important to understand the culture in which uh, evaluations are being released. And uh, the uh, ex experience of UNRWA was uh, particularly enriching in that respect. A dialogue with direct stakeholders, with those that are important decision makers and who will be the, 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 um, the best beneficiaries of the results of an evaluation. Um, <clears throat> We have seen how the communications can be embedded into the overall uh, cycle of evaluation to try to uh, enhance the sense of ownership over the final results of the evaluation, including its recommendations and the likelihood of those recommendations to be used and taken up. Therefore, we need to tailor those messages and uh, for that, uh, hopefully we will be able also to provide feedback to our beneficiaries. 
There were concerns about the quality assurance of uh, the communications uh, staff that is going out, that it needs to be consistent with the content of the evaluation reports, uh, that we need to be aware and try not to get into the traps of oversimplification of messages because we know that we are dealing with complex issues. The use of social media should be just an instrument to facilitate dissemination and cross-fertilization of the reports. And finally, to really keep in mind the importance of our target audiences and the purposes for this. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you very much for this active uh, press conference. Um, uh, I, I know that we have a reception at the EPE yeah. uh, uh, in the upper floor. And, uh, yes, this floor uh, unfortunately, please. before we all go upstairs and enjoy the reception and Danny Kay, mm -hmm. we're now going to take a photo. So if everyone could kindly just, in the next 60 seconds, gather on the stage, all right. we'll remove the chairs and take the photo. Okay. Thanks. Good, thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.